So let's have a bit of a background behind John 15 before we get there. So as of John 13, Jesus is in quite an intimate, closed off setting with his disciples. It's just, just after the Last Supper. Okay. And, uh, th- this all, uh, 13, 14, 15, pretty much continuing the same, uh, conversations and exchanges. So 15 is not like a standalone verse with a completely different context. It pretty much follows on from 14 and 13. So towards the end of 13, Jesus has a conversation specifically with Simon Peter. Okay. Now, if you remember from the other uh, synoptic gospel accounts, Peter didn't want Jesus to go through with his death. And and so Jesus rebuked him saying, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of of the things of, of God. So perhaps before Peter at that time failed to grasp that, that Jesus must go through with this. Now, here it seems like he's come to terms with it a bit more. So uh, where, where you go, uh, I will go, um, he's, he's saying to Jesus, I, I will lay down my life for your sake. Now, we, we know obviously Peter didn't follow through with that. But again, salvation is dependent on what? Jesus did. It's not, it's not based on us laying down our life. You didn't lay your life down for Jesus. Okay. Jesus laid his life down for us. So, uh, that there's Peter, but, but Jesus does know that Peter shall follow him afterwards. And so we obviously know that after the cross, Peter will be a lot more bold and, and brave in his faith than the time when Jesus actually goes to his death. And because Jesus already knows this about Peter, Again, it's meaningless to say that Peter lost his salvation when he denied Jesus three times and then got it back again all of a sudden because Jesus already knows the outcomes. You can't say, well, if Peter had died that day, he would have gone to hell because he lost his salvation. Jesus already knows the outcome. Again, just get it into your head that Jesus knows everything. It's meaningless to say people are temporarily saved or temporarily lose their salvation. It, It doesn't work with the concept of Jesus knowing everything. Okay, so Peter seems... We don't really know a lot about what Peter's thinking here, but it seems like maybe he's come to terms with it a little bit more about what Jesus has got to go and do. But uh, And again, Jesus Jesus already knows, you will deny me three times, but you shall follow me afterwards. And so um, the key word to get out of this passage, although it doesn't mention it, is the word confidence, okay? Jesus has got to build the disciples' confidence. And we'll, we'll, we'll pick up that as, as we look through these uh, chapters and we can relate it to some of the parts of the Bible as well. Okay, so so confidence is the key word here. So then the, this conversation elaborates in John 14, where he's not just talking to Peter, but he's talking to all the disciples because all the disciples question him as well. Okay, that they, they respond with various things. So he's saying, uh, you know, let not your heart be troubled. So there's a good reason why he's telling them a lot of stuff in this conversation. Okay, don't be troubled, because you know I'm a, Jesus is about to go to his death. Okay, he's about to depart from the disciples. Don't let your heart be troubled. Okay, so that, again, that, that's that key word confidence. It's confidence boost going on right here. You believe in God. Okay, you already believe that. Believe also in me. Okay, now remember, the disciples have been following Jesus up to now. They've been faithful with him when other disciples left in John chapter six, the 12, if we minus Judas, the 11, they've stayed with him. Okay, they've stayed with him up to this point. They haven't just completely thrown in the towel. Okay, so there's some things where, you know, they need a bit of a confidence boost. Jesus needs to reaffirm some things that they really should have grasped by now. But but they have still stayed with with him up to this point. They didn't stumble at his teachings like like some others did. Okay. Now then, he says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would uh, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, there is some eternal life-esque language here, but how to get eternal life or what you must do for eternal life is not really the subject matter of the beginning of this chapter here. OK, it's about what Jesus has got to go and do. For, to allow all that to happen. Okay. What Jesus is about to go and do is obviously necessary for believers to get into heaven. And so, yes, there are many mansions for them, but that's not the key point of the conversation. Jesus is not telling his disciples how to be saved onto eternal life. Okay. They've already listened to all of his conversations that he's had with the Jews and various people about that stuff. Okay. So it's about what Jesus has got to go and do. That's what he's dealing with in these chapters. Okay. So I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again um, and, and so on. And then Thomas here says, Lord, we we don't know where you go. How can we know the way? OK, 
Now look how Jesus replies here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So again, this is the closest direct mention of anything related to eternal life throughout this entire exchange. That's the closest mention. And again, it's not the focus of what Jesus is actually saying because it's not about how to enter life. It's about what Jesus must go and do. So no man comes unto the Father but by me. Okay, again, the disciples should already grasp that. So if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and I've seen him. Again, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's reaffirming what really the disciples have already heard him say similar things to the Jews. So in a way, it's even baffling that they're even answering this question. But we know from hindsight that after Jesus' resurrection, obviously, we've got doubting Thomas there, the guy who's not going to accept the resurrection quite straight away. He's going to be a little bit doubtful in his mind there. Okay. But remember, he's not thrown in the towel. He's not stumbled at Jesus' teaching. He stayed up with Jesus to this point. Okay. Philip says unto him, again, not quite grasping what Jesus has said there, show us the Father and it suffices us. And, and, and again, this is, Jesus is almost baffled here by the question, almost, because Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not known me, Philip? You know, it, it's almost strange that Philip's asked this question. He's just explained, you've seen me. How long have they been with Jesus at this point? So there's stuff that, yes, they they listen to Jesus' teachings, they've been his disciples, but there's still some stuff that they're just not quite grasping here. And, and they need to try and grasp this. Okay. So he that's seen me, seen the Father. So, so how do you even say what you've just said, Philip? You know, how do you even ask this? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in, in me? And okay, and you know, you would think that he does believe it, but you know, that there's just something not not quite right about what he's getting here. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father dwells in me and he does the work. So again, it's it's reaffirming this son father relationship in Christ. Okay? Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Truly I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I shall do, he do also, and greater works than these he shall do, because I go unto my Father. So it's not, although he's using this believe language, which is typically what we've seen about eternal life up to this point in John's Gospel, he's not really emphasising the bit about having eternal life because they believe on me. He's, em he's emphasising his relationship with the Father and that they will do these works because of what Jesus is doing, because Jesus goes on to my Father. Okay, so it, it again, it's that keyword confidence. This is a confidence boost, what's happening here. So then he goes on to explain, and this is where there is a bit of a two-way relationship between Jesus and his disciples here. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So you ask things of me, don't doubt, because I will do them, because the Father is glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So again, confidence in what you ask. And like as it James says, have uh, you know, have faith. We don't have a wavering faith when you ask things of your Father. Okay? And then he goes on to say, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, so there's that saying that they love to quote about how, you know, all these works you've got to do to, to get to heaven, but he's not telling them how to enter into life here. He's telling them, look, if you ask things in my name, I will do it for you. I'm going to my father. I'm going out to do this stuff for you, and you shall do this as a result of me doing that. So there's the context of what he means by that, okay? Keep my commandments if you love me, okay? And, you know, what you shall ask in my name, that will I do, okay? Now, then he says, uh, I will send you another comforter, because remember, Jesus is going to be with the Father. So again, it's that comfort, it's that confidence, okay? It, there's two C words, if you like, that he's trying to get out of here. The spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him. Uh, you know him, for he dwells in you and, and shall be in you. Now, notice here it says, because they want to take this about the Holy Spirit, and it's, well, you have to obey him to get the Holy Spirit. Well, John 7 already explained that the Holy Ghost is given to those that believe, but it, it, it's not yet given, though. The Holy Spirit was not yet given at this point. But then look exactly what Jesus says in verse 17. He dwells in you and shall future tense be in you. OK, and, and he shall. So, that, so there's a future application to the Holy Spirit coming. But there's also a present tense. He dwells in you. So him dwell, the, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you is not quite the same thing as he shall be in you. And I've done stuff on my channel about that in, in quite a brief way. Um, but don't confuse 
multiple roles that the spirit has okay because the holy spirit can be dwelling in you such that you have eternal life but that that doesn't necessarily mean that he comes upon you like like he came upon certain people in the old testament and and why does he come upon you well in in that aspect it, it's for comfort okay or it's to give you words to speak as he will explain the the role of the holy spirit um in, in the upcoming uh, dialogue here and also in, in chapter 16 okay so so don't turn that into something about salvation when it's not okay that John 7 said the Holy Spirit would be given in, in a future tense, but there were still people believing on his name at that time. Okay. So I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you uh, yet a little while. The world sees me no more, but because I live, you shall live also. So again, it, although there is some aspect of living there, it, it's more about what Jesus is going to do. Okay. Not so much about what you should do. And at that day, you shall know, not you shall do, you shall know the time in my father and in, in you in me and I in you. So you shall know when this all comes to pass. So this is, this is going to be the point where they have confidence in their faith, because here in this chapter doesn't really look like all the disciples have a lot of confidence about about Jesus. But then when you start getting to Acts and when they start preaching the gospel, it's a very different story. So Jesus is going to solidify their faith. You know, he is going to go to his death, but he's going to rise again. OK, so he needs to go through all of that so that the disciples finally grasp it. OK, Um and then we go on to the bits where, again, these are more things that they like to, to pluck out. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he is it that loves me, and he loves me shall be loved in my Father. Um, if a man love me, he will keep my words. The Father will love him, and, and he will come into him, and make our abode with him. He that loves me not, keeps not my sayings, and, and so on. And so these are the kind of words, you know, the you can lose your salvation passages. But he's not really explaining exactly what happens to the people who don't love him other than that they keep not his sayings he does he's not mentioning hellfire here he's not exactly saying eternal life there because he could just come out and say it. he could just come out and say he that loves me not shall be cast into hellfire but he just doesn't say that there and if it's so important he could have mentioned it but he doesn't okay and this is where you see that they take these passages about john 15 about making it about you can lose your salvation when the right words aren't coming up because he's not emphasizing doing all of that stuff for eternal life specifically okay now in john chapter 6 and john chapter 10 it's a very important part of the conversation your eternal life and, and that you must believe in him for eternal life that's not really the point that jesus is getting across here okay he's trying to comfort his disciples you know and, and then when all this has happened you you shall you you shall know that i am in you and so uh, you know, if you love me, then keep my commandments that I've given you. Okay. So then uh, he talks a little bit more about the Holy Ghost. He's a comforter. The Father shall send in my name. He shall teach you all of these things. Bring them to remembrance whatsoever I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit there kind of uh, as a deposit for, for Christ not being there physically with them. And so the Holy Ghost compensates for that okay and he'll give them that that peace okay the world can't give that peace but he can be that peace so again what what's the point of jesus telling them all this stuff let not your heart be troubled which is what he said um higher up as well um at the beginning so you can kind of see those as the book ends to everything that Jesus is saying here. Why is he telling them this stuff? Why is he telling them to keep his commandments? Why is he telling them about the Holy Ghost? We've got book ends there. Let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Okay. So I go my way. I go away and come again to you. He's going to come back to them. Okay. If you loved me, you would rejoice, but, but they're not rejoicing because they're failing to grasp this. And so they, they must understand here that what Jesus is about to go and do is a good thing. And, and it's for their sake that he's doing it as well. That's what they need to understand that perhaps they've not quite grasped yet. All right. And so at the end, he says, but the, the world may know that I love the father and that the father gave me commandments. Even so do I. So that again, Jesus is doing this stuff and the whole world may know. Okay. So, um, there, there, there again, that's the purpose of why Jesus is doing these things, that the world may know these things, not not just the disciples who he's talking to here. So there's a little bit of background leading us up into John chapter 15, okay? And so here, here in, uh, lies John chapter 15, the, the real crux of the matter about some of the things that they say you can lose your salvation. So obviously uh, they point to things like where it says, um, every branch of me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Um, and uh, further down, if a man not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And so, uh, and then 
cast into the fire and they're the kind of you can lose your salvation and go to hell type um verses there that, that they will use okay and so they make this abide about your continual fight of faith to try and stay in the path of salvation which again he he's if you just look at, across these entire verses here eternal life is not being directly mentioned Hell is not really being directly mentioned either, although you might argue that this is fire is very strong language if it means something else other than hellfire. So we'll we'll get to that. We'll we'll uh, we'll look at that in in a while. Um, but you know, e eternal life is just not mentioned in this particular area. Okay, uh, being saved or the word saved, it is not particularly mentioned here. Okay, so it's again this is where they have to take the less clear passages where jesus could actually be talking about something else and they override the clear passages like john 6 and john 10 where jesus actually is talking about eternal life okay and so here's the problem when you take passages like this to mean that you can lose your salvation but we will play the devil's advocate and say you know it, it does look as if that's what jesus is saying it does look as if he's kind of going on the opposite of, of the kind of stuff that he said in, in John chapter 6, John chapter 10. I grant you that, but let's, again, we have to look specifically at the exact words that Jesus uses and try and understand this in the scope of, of everything else that Jesus said in John. Okay, so that's what we're, we're going to try and do um, as, as we look through this chapter, all right? So going into this, let, let's just remind ourselves, let's just backtrack and remind ourselves of a few things, okay? In this video here, he, he tried to frame it as... It's the, the sheep that's walking away. So it's not that Jesus is leaving you. You're, you're leaving him. Okay. That's how he framed how losing salvation works. Okay. And there's a comment in this vi very video where somebody says that, well, I know no one can snatch me out of your hand, but I could always crawl away myself. And, and he gives that a, um, a like there. Okay. So that, that's how the argument's been framed that it's, it's you leaving him or, or you walking away from him. Okay. And then similarly, that's how he framed it in this way, that, that Jesus is going this way. So if you wander and, and go that way, that's why you lose your salvation, because it's it's you that's doing the falling away. It's you that's doing the walking away. OK, now in this video, they, they do talk about uh, God forsaking you, but it, it's still under the condition that you've forsaken him first based on um, a, a Chronicles passage there. Okay, so uh, yeah, there is an aspect here of God forsaking you, but it, it predominantly revolves around you forsaking him first. So again, it's, you're the one who's leaving, you're the one who's going, okay? And then uh, in this video, his journey out of one saved, always saved. If you look just before the nine minute mark, he says pretty much the same as that comment that he gave a thumbs up to, that, well, this verse says that no one can snatch me out of his hand, but that, that says nothing about me walking away. And so that that's how he framed how losing your salvation works that you through your free will you've chosen to walk away okay well immediately then we we've got some problems here okay if 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 you're going to say all that that it's you leaving you're the one who's doing the leaving you're the one who's doing the forsaking you're the one who walks away and that's how lo loss of salvation applies well, the problem is that goes against the narrative of what actually happens in John 15, because in John 15, it says that it's the father who's the husbandman. So every branch in me that bears not fruit, he he takes away. So it doesn't say that the branch withers and dies and falls off. OK, he, the father, takes away. So he actually does cut them off. OK. And um, it goes on to say then um, that uh, if a man not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch. So it doesn't say the branch again. It doesn't say that the branch falls off and falls into the ground and, and withers away or decomposes or anything like that. OK, someone actually has to remove the branch and then cast it into the fire. OK, so immediately we've got a problem there because the way this is framing it is no, actually, the father does actually pull you away take you away and throw you away it's not well you just choose to walk away that that's not how this is being framed so again it's the it's these contradictory argument points where they change how it actually works in the different passages where where it suits them to do so okay if it was about you walking away this would make more sense if if it was the branches just dying and falling off like a dead branch that just rots and falls off that that's not how jesus frames this argument so it, it again it just it doesn't work with how they try and bring it together with other passages all right 
Now let me show you another problem with, with their conditional Securitard framework, okay? Is that they take this word here where it says fruit, bearing not fruit. They make that about works, okay? It's all about you've got to do the works. People often, again, I mentioned this earlier, that people just take the word fruit and they make that mean works. Okay, but if you just understand, I, I don't even know that much about gardening. And even to me, I understand how stupid that is. Okay, because look what's going on here. What What's the analogy that Jesus is actually using? It's a vine. Okay, a vine, a tree. You, you might say a tree that grows grapes, for example, of a vine tree. Okay, great grapes to make wine. So the, a branch that has to bear fruit. Well, fruit it, when a tree grows fruit, that's not work, okay? No, no, that's not how work works. That someone has to be trimming that tree and doing work on that tree in order for it to grow fruit, okay? Well, according to this, who is it who's doing the work? Well, it, it tells you, Jesus says, my father is the husbandman. So any, if there's any branches that aren't bearing any fruit, he takes away, because he's the one that's doing the work here, okay? He's the husbandman that's trimming and, and, and doing stuff to this vine here. So that there's nothing about the branch itself doing any work. The branch just grows, and it's the father that's doing the work here. So again, work salvation just doesn't work with this analogy. And it says that every branch that bears fruit, again, he purges it. Why does he purge it? He, he takes the fruit. So, so he's doing the work. He's trimming this tree. He's working on this vine. A branch that's growing fruit, he trims it. And why does he do that? So that it may bring forth more fruit. But so the fruit is the product of this vine. It's, it's something that grows as a result of a, of a branch that is part of this vine. But who's doing the work? The father is doing the actual work here. So making this fruit about works doesn't work, if you pardon the pun, okay? It, it goes against how the analogy is being set up, okay? And if you want to make this, that uh, the branches that bear no fruit, they're the ones who are not doing any work. And so they're the ones that are going to be cast forth and, and thrown into the fire. Well, here's the problem. If the father is the one doing the work up here, and all it says is that he just takes the branch away, that's really all it says about the father... Who is casting into the fire, according to verse 6? It says that men gather them and cast them into the fire. Well, what man on this planet can throw you into hell? Okay, that doesn't make any sense. That's why the Bible says, fear him who's able to uh, put your body and soul into hell. That's the Father, it's not man. Man can't put you in hell. Fear not him who can only destroy the body, but afterwards can do you no harm, okay? It's the Father that we should fear because he's the one that can put you in, in hell as far as your soul's concerned. So making that about hell is utterly ridiculous based on that premise alone, that men can't do that to you, okay? So here's the problem. When, when you try and make that so literal about hellfire, it, it doesn't work with the analogy that's being put forward, okay? Jesus is using an analogy. So you, you've got to try and understand how your framework even fits with this analogy. Otherwise, Jesus is just rambling and saying nothing here if you just completely change the narrative of what's actually being addressed, okay? And so then it, it raises the question as, as why is Jesus even using this analogy? Why why is he talking about a vine and a branch here? What what exactly is this branch talking about? Now if, if it's talking about eternal life, he's not exactly using the right terms here. He's not really mentioned eternal life in these verses. Again, he he, he could have just said they, they, those branches are cast into hellfire, but that's not what he says. He just says men gather them and cast them into the fire. So to make that about hell, we, we've already got a problem. So it's not exactly explicitly sp explained here why exactly Jesus is telling them this other than surrounding contexts. Now, you could possibly make it about believers falling into sin, perhaps, if that's what you were going to make it about, that the, the branches that bear no fruit, they're the branches that are falling in sin. Well, then when it says, uh, cast them into the fire, that there are examples of uh, verses in the New Testament where the job of the church is to judge people that are in, in serious sin, and, and there are verses that deal with 
throwing somebody out of church. And we've, we've got, um, you know, we, we looked at the chastisement of believers very early in this refutation. And so casting, casting them into the fire doesn't even have to mean hellfire. And if it's men gather them, well, you, you could argue that that's the church throwing out these unprofitable things. But the thing is, again, church and sin, like eternal life, that's not really part of the language being used here either. Okay. We've got nothing to go on other than that the the disciples are told to abide that that's really the, the key context that's going on here so abide is is the main thing that we we've got to go on well well what does it mean to abide it, it means to continue and uh, you know or it means to to stay so or to remain in you might say so you could also say remain in Okay. Now remember, up to now, what, what did I say our, our key words were? We were looking at confidence. We were looking at, uh, sorry, it's not showing the word remain. I don't know why, but we're, uh, we're looking at confidence. We're looking at comfort. Okay. He's been trying to comfort them. Look, I'm sending you my comforter. You know, believe in me that I'm in the Father and what I'm about to go and do is, you know, it's for your sake. And, it, and he's going to go on in this chapter with, with more words of, of comfort and confidence. So he's building up the disciples here for everything that he's going to do and everything that the disciples are going to do. The disciples are going to go out into the world and, and bear much fruit. Okay. And, and that fruit is going to remain. So it's all about continuing. So. We, we, again, and, and a good way of looking at that would be, uh, you know, don't give up, okay? Or, or you could look at this as saying, don't lose hope, okay? And, um, you know, don't don't lose comfort. Um, so I'll just put that at the end there as well. Don't don't lose comfort. So again, this is this is an encouragement. It's not a chastisement. It, it, it's not even a, a warning, really, because it, it, it only there's only a couple of verses where he, he gives the warnings. Mo most of this is comforting language. Jesus is going to be with them. Okay, Jesus is going to help them bear much fruit. And he says, "Without me, you can do nothing." So again, it's that comfort. Jesus is going to help you do these things. Don't give up. And he goes on to tell the disciples later in the chapter that you you will be hated in this world for for namesake okay but remember the words that i've said unto you if they persecute you know you keep my sayings okay um so that, that's the points that he's really getting them across it's this comfort it's this encouragement to, to remain in christ and what he's going to do at his death burial and resurrection is really solidify the faith of the disciples because you know the, the faith seems to be a bit rocky at this point there's still stuff that they're not understanding so again it's that confidence boost okay it's the encouragement that he's trying to do so that's the point that he's trying to get them across in all of this okay now then who are the branches that bear fruit okay so if if these branches need to bear fruit to to remain uh, attached to the vine who are they well it's quite simple you read down to verse four and it explains abide in me and I in you, because the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Branches don't naturally grow fruit unless they're attached to a vine, okay? So abide in the vine, stay in Christ, and if you stay in Christ, then you can bear fruit. So it's not really evident here that there's all these works of obedience, but you, you remain in Christ, whatever that happens to mean, you stay with Christ and you remain attached to Christ, okay? Well, Christ is the vine, and, and you are the branches. So uh, the branches grow fruit, but again, we we already saw that the father is is the husband, and he's the one who's actually doing the work on on this vine. Okay, so don't make this fruit all about your works when it when it's not. So um, so there you go. So why should we abide in him so that we can keep our salvation? Well, he does give you a reason in verse seven, although he doesn't strictly say it's about salvation. Though, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask of what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So, remain in Christ, what you ask of Christ, you shall receive. Again, very similar to what he told them earlier, and what, like what James says, uh, ask, you know, ask and it shall be given unto you. Don't have a wavering faith, otherwise what, what can you expect to receive from God? Now, you could make that about eternal life, but the thing is, again, he's not exactly saying that that's the specific purpose of telling them that, okay? Then he goes on to say, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love, so continue just being uh, another word for abide, if you like. Well, well, why should we continue in his love? What's the outcome of that? So he then says, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my 
love. Okay, so uh, this is what you're abiding in. It doesn't say you're abiding in my eternal life or the life that I give or, or my salvation. Um, it, it's just that you abide in, in his love, uh, whatever that happens to be. That you, you ask of him and, and he shall give unto you. Okay, and again, why does he tell them these things? Well, it's so that your joy might be full. So there's the issue. He doesn't say so that you keep your salvation. That's just not what he says. It's that joy may remain in you. So if you're not doing these things, if you don't remain in his love, you you will lose your joy. Okay, there's the issue. And again, if this is so important to eternal life and salvation, why isn't he using those terms? He could just say it in, in, in this verse right here in 11. He doesn't say it, okay? He uses joy. So again, you have to then accuse Jesus of using somewhat fluffy language for something that's actually very, very important if, if you want to say that that equates to losing salvation, okay? And uh, there's a psalm where, uh, I think it's is it Psalm 51, J uh, David prays for, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He doesn't say restore to me my salvation. It's the joy, okay? So uh, then he goes on to say, uh, this is my commandment, that you love one another. Why? Because I have loved you already. Okay. Um, and, he, you know, Jesus is going to lay down his life for his friends. And here's a key bit. You are my friends, if if whatsoever I, I command you. So it doesn't say you are saved if, if you do what I command you. You are my friends. So just ask yourself, okay, e even under the free grace model, even if you finally come to accept faith alone and one saved, always saved, and, and you're thinking, well, what happens? You know, can I continue and say, well, well, the thing is, do you want to be Jesus's friend? Okay. And if you're going to say that being friends is a, is a condition of, of, of eternal life, well, the problem is that he says to his disciples, henceforth, I call you not so servants okay i call i have called you my friends so there is a difference between being jesus's servant and being his friend okay it, it, jesus isn't really elaborating on that here but the difference is there though okay you have not chosen me i have chosen you and i have ordained you that you should go for and bring forth fruit. So, so there's the actual work there, if anything. Here, it's not that you uh, grow for it, you bring forth fruit. So that if there's any work that you do, there it is, okay? That he's ordained that you should you should do that, okay? And that your fruit will remain. Again, why should we bring forth fruit? Why should we do what we've ordained? So that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So there is your reason. So notice multiple times, we've got a reason in verse 15. We've got a reason there in uh, verse 11, okay? We've got a reason there in verse 14. Three different verses here give us a reason, and none of them have mentioned your salvation. None of them have mentioned your eternal life, okay? There's the reason. Do you want your joy to be full? Well, well, who doesn't want that? What, what Christian in the world doesn't want that, okay? So, you know, you, you can turn free grace into this license to sin just because you're sinning without a license anyway. But, you know what? We, we still want our joy to be full, even if we believe in free grace, believe it or not. You know, we, we still want to be called Jesus' friends, okay? And, and this thing about doing what Jesus commands so that you be his friends. Where have we heard that before? Well, ages ago, we looked at James chapter 2. Let me scroll across for you. So there it is, folks, the, the justification by works as well as faith that James was talking about. Okay, the scripture was fulfilled. Well, he believed God and that, that was accounted unto him for righteousness. But some other scripture was fulfilled as well. He was called a friend of God. Okay, so yes, he believed God. That's his righteousness. That's his salvation. That's his path from death unto life. But he was also called a friend of God, okay? And so there's your justification for works, to be called a friend of God, okay? And, and to complete your your faith by making it perfect, to, to show the faith that you actually believe in, okay? So there it is. And so really here it is there, folks. That's why conditional security from John 15 falls apart, because Jesus gives you three different reasons across these verses and not a single one of them mentions your salvation directly. OK, he doesn't mention that word. So, you know, you, you want to make this about salvation. Well, the problem is they're the reasons that Jesus gives you. So really, you, you have to take it up with Jesus. So it's not, you know, it's not that we reject the words of Jesus, OK, because we believe in eternal security. It's that we just look at the reason why Jesus says these things. OK, it's called studying the Bible to actually say, see what it actually really says. OK, but nevertheless, folks, OK, if you're just looking at this bit in verse six about being cast into the fire and, and you're a bit nervous because you think, well, you know what, that's quite strong language if it doesn't mean hellfire. So what if we should take some salva salvation application to it? So what happens to the person 
who doesn't continue in Christ. Let, let's just address that so that at least we've left no stone unturned, okay? Just in case we want to interpret it that way. Well, let's... let. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll entertain you. Let's look at it through the lens of salvation then. Okay, so we know that we've got to abide or continue in Christ. We know that we've got to remain in Christ. And if that doesn't happen, we're cast into the fire. Well, remember earlier, let, let's, let's re-explore this concept of grafting. Now, uh, John doesn't mention grafting here, but remember Epiusion, uh, in his same video about John 15, also mentioned the Romans 11 concept about grafting. So there's a branch that wasn't in Christ, and it became part of that branch. But just like it could be cut out in Romans 11, well, it, it can also be cut out here in John 15 as well. Okay, so obviously people will confront Epiusion and say, well, those branches weren't really saved, they weren't really believers. And then, so he'll ask the question, well, why were they branches in Christ then? Okay, why? A good question. Okay, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Well, let's, the thing is with this passage here, it, it doesn't really tell us how the branches were in Christ in the first place. So we'll just have to cross-reference Romans 11 and say that you were a branch cut off from another olive tree and you were grafted into the good branch okay so at some point you weren't a part of the true branch and then you became part of the true branch okay and then the, but then there is this prospect that you can be cut off okay so that's what we're going to look at um as the way that we examine exactly what jesus is saying here if we're going to make it about salvation okay because believe it or not folks eternal security free grace we can answer this, okay? We can deal with that, all right? So let, let, let's just deal with it. So let, let's look at this concept of grafting then, okay? If you're a branch in Christ and you can be cut off, were you definitely saved? Do, do you have to be saved for that to be true? To, to be a branch in Christ, must must you be saved as opposed to just being a branch in Christ that's, that's not saved? Is that possible? Well, let, let's understand a little bit about grafting and how it actually works. And, th and then we'll, we'll understand these, these metaphors and analogies, won't we? Now, do excuse me for using Wikipedia. I don't know how accurate Wikipedia is. Okay. But, you know, this isn't exactly a subject where people need to particularly lie about for some, you know, political agenda or something like that. So, you can look up the page grafting and you've got a nice uh, lengthy article with, with quite a lot of stuff about how it actually works. OK, so in a nutshell, you've got two separate trees and what you can do with trees is take the branch out of one tree or a branch that was from another tree and you can graft it into a different tree. And eventually, if the grafting is successful, it will become part of that other tree. So in, in human terms, this would be a bit like if you could like don't like donating an organ i suppose you you can take an organ out of one person put it in another person and if that person's body accepts it well then their body can can work with that organ okay in its place so there there's a similar concept in in human terms so it goes on to explain shortly in the intro that uh, for successful grafting to take place, the vascular cambium tissues of the stock and the cyan plants must be placed in contact with each other. And watch this. Look at this bit. This is the key bit to understanding how this works. Both tissues must be kept alive until the graft has taken. And it usually lasts for a few weeks. So there's a time period where you've got to keep it alive during this time period otherwise it won't be successful so that that process must happen for the graft to be successful okay so and then successful grafting requires that a, a connection take place between the tissue so uh, the the, t the thing that's been grafted and the branch they've got to successfully join together for, for this to work all right otherwise it, it's just not going to be successful so there's grafting that will be successful there's grafting that won't be successful so the idea that grafting will be successful and then a few years later it suddenly becomes unsuccessful is not here once again we've got two types we always have these two types of people when we look at these different passages you know you've got he that believes he that believes not you've got he that's in the flesh and he that's of the spirit there's no third type of person that's just sort of like flipping between the two that, that's that's just not offered by these passages that we go to. So we've got those that graft successfully and those that graft unsuccessfully. OK, there's really only two camps there. Now, it goes on to give you some reasons for grafting, some of the advantages of grafting. So one of them, uh, prosocity, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that, but um, it introduces fruitfulness. So a branch can then grow 
fruit without having to complete its juvenile phase. So it doesn't have to become a fully mature, fully grown branch to bear fruit. It can bear fruit much earlier in its life than it would be if it wasn't grafted into another branch. So a good analogy would be, you know, you don't need to be an absolute expert in the Bible and take years and years of your Christian life before you can grow fruit. You can grow fruit fairly early in your Christian life. Okay, there's there's a good uh, similarity there. Uh, Dwarfing, so this is like where um, you can take characteristics characteristics of uh, another tree and you can induce that in, into the tree that's being grafted into so it's like uh, you can adapt cold tolerance it can take some beneficial properties so again a good similarity in our terms would be like the body of christ and every, you know everybody's a different body part like you've got an arm and you've got a leg and you've got a nose and so on so you know different believers can bring different gifts there, there's another way that you could look at that and that there's various uh, other um advantages as well that you can see on the screen a little like uh, hybrid breeding reduces the time to flowering shorten the breeding process. so again it's, it's bringing forth that fruit quicker what does the father do he's he's doing work on this vine so that it can bring forth more fruit so that that's what grafting does it, it can be used to bring forth more fruit okay now then further down the article it, it starts to give you some factors that would make the graft successful okay it's got it's got to be successful it's, it's got to meet these factors to, to be successful so first and foremost you've got compatibility so normally grafting is between trees of the same species sometimes you can mix what would be called closely related uh species if, if you like but if, if trees are two completely different species it, it's just not going to work okay so somebody again let's apply that to christianese terms well somebody that's just got no interest in jesus no interest in the word no interest in things eternal well they're not going to graft very well are they folks they're, they're not going to be compatible with christ they're not going to be a successful graft okay and you've got other things like cambium alignment and pressure so tightly pressing them together um in it, oriented in the direction of, of normal growth it's that proper alignment and pressure encourages the tissues to to join quickly and, and it needs to happen quickly emphasize there so uh, the nutrients and the water can flow through so if it's not again if that's not done properly that won't happen okay and so you've got these other things as well for, for making sure that um you know the appropriate moisture is going through the appropriate nutrients are going through it's being kept alive that the temperature's right and you've got to have proper care of, of the graft site nursing nursing it back to health so, so there is some injury sustained in the grafting process there okay so these are all the different factors that, that can determine whether a graft is going to be successful and i found this article about grafting citrus and it, and it gives you some pictures and descriptions of what to do to graft citrus and then look what happened so at, at six months the graft the grafts were in leaf and flower so it, it takes six months before we can really see whether it was successful it wasn't immediately obvious okay so it wasn't like well you just graft it and it starts growing fruit straight away no this is a gradual process and you have to wait for it to grow fruit but notice what he said here one of the grafts failed but two or two of three survived so there's, there's a couple that survived but there is one that failed okay this article doesn't go on to explain what 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 you do with the failed branch okay so I, I found something else i found something from the university so this is something about when a graft is unsuccessful it gives a number of causes so again we, we saw that there were factors to a successful graft there can be things like disease obviously and, and all that kind of stuff so there, there's some examples of when it's not successful and so it, it gives symptoms so uh, the most pronounced symptom of graft failure is a, a clean breaking off of a tree at the graft union so it, it gets broken off and, and that even happens naturally in the case of real grafting okay other symptoms of graft failure include general ill health of the tree and the shoot dieback so there's an example of where you'd probably want to remove it so that you you don't have those, those kind of symptoms okay but this is what it even goes on to say it, it's possible it is possible for trees to survive with some of these above symptoms but a combination of many symptoms may result in in the premature death of the tree so if a graft is unsuccessful you're not going to want to leave it there for the same reason if you know if somebody's got those like leprosy or gangrene or whatever it is where part of the flesh is dying you don't leave the leg attached okay this the, the sur surgeons have to remove that because it could infect the rest of the body okay so there's a good reason why you would then have to cut it off okay so a, a good biblical analogy a little leaven leavens the whole lump purge that old leaven okay there, there's a, a really good uh, similarity there 
Now here it does give some symptoms, but obviously the only symptoms we've got from the Bible is that it just it doesn't bear much fruit. Okay, that 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 seems to be the only symptom that that Jesus really delves into is is an allergy. So, so therein lies the problem. A branch is grafted in, and it's either going to be successful or it's going to be unsuccessful. One one or the other. Okay, it, it's not well. You you plug it in, you take it out. You plug it in, you take it out. And either it's successful or it isn't. And you need to make sure that 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 branch that's being grafted in has has no disease or anything like that. You need to make sure that you do it properly when you graft it in. Okay. So then, if we're dealing in the context of salvation, well, we've got the vine, that's Jesus, okay. A branch is grafted in, so remember it wasn't part of the vine earlier. It's grafted in, but it takes a few weeks to see if it's going to be a successful graft. You don't know straight away, okay. It takes time, and you've got to make sure that you do the job properly. So remember, the father is the husband one, so he he's the one doing the work here. Okay. And remember in John chapter six, I will go to eternal life section. Um, no man can come to me except the father draw him, that the father's got to do something for somebody to come to Jesus. Otherwise it doesn't work. And that's why there were some disciples that walked no more with him. And Jesus knew from the beginning, they believe not. They were not the ones that were drawn of the father. So they were not grafted in properly. So if we have a branch here that's not grafted in properly, well, that's where you cut it off. Okay. Now, was it part of that vine? Okay. Was it, was it in the vine? Well, in a manner of speaking, yes, it, it was part of the vine. Okay. But was it a successful graft? Uh, okay. What was it successful? Did it, did it bring forth any fruit? Well, the answer is no. So that's why you cut it off. Now, Remember that we, we saw that one of the factors is that you have to keep the branch alive. So if the branch then doesn't stay alive, it, it won't be a successful graft. And so you might say, well, do, well, does that mean the branch lost its salvation then because it was once alive? But remember that in actual grafting, you, you're not taking a dead branch from another tree. You are taking a living branch. So to, to say that because it was living in a real analogy, you know, in, in real grafting, that it, it that means it was saved. Well, well, no, okay, because otherwise, why was it saved before it was grafted in? That that wouldn't make any sense. You, you can't look at it that way. So, the branch then that does not abide, it it, it was put in this branch. It was put in this vine, but it wasn't a successful graft. Okay, it did not pass from death onto life. That's why it says in John chapter six, the disciples that walked no more with him. Jesus knew from the beginning who believe not. That is why I say unto you, no man can come to me except the father draw him. The father, the husbandman, he's got to be doing the work of this grafting for it to be successful. If that doesn't happen, it won't be successful. And so here's the problem. No, absolutely. It, it doesn't say that you can lose your salvation. Then, If you're not a successful graft, you can't say that you were ever saved because if you were saved, this graft should be successful. But it wasn't. But but you don't know that straight away, okay? I, I, if, if you do grafting, you're not going to immediately know whether it was successful. It takes time to find out it was successful. But remember, Jesus knows these things from the very beginning. He already knows what's going to be successful and what's not going to be successful, okay? And again, just grasp this idea for one miserable day that God knows everything. He's seen the future. Well, you could lose your salvation if you sin tomorrow. Well, God already knew if I would sin tomorrow. He's already foreseen it. Okay. So again, j just grasp that, please. Just please grasp that. So if it wasn't a successful graft, it wasn't saved. So I'm just going to draw a chart for those of you that, that like the pictorial stuff. So then we have a man who was grafted in. So that's where we, we thought he was passed from death onto life. We, we thought he believed the gospel as far as we knew. He was grafted in. He became part of the branch. But then he was cut off and cast onto the fire. He did, he did not bear any fruit. So he was cast off. And so he falls under the damnation category. Well, he did not graft successfully. So therefore, he did not pass from death onto life. Because if he did pass from death onto life, he would bear fruit. Well, what does that mean? Well, he would have grafted successfully. He would have believed onto eternal life. But he didn't believe. Okay. So there you have it, folks. And, and Jesus already knows from the beginning who believe not. So because it was an unsuccessful graft, you can't say that he was temporarily saved. Because remember, again, abide means to continue. Now, when 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 it was here in the time in time, did it look like he continued? It, it did look like that up until that point. When it got to about there, did it look like he continued? Yes. But then once we get to here, we realize in hindsight 
no, he didn't continue. So you can't say he temporarily abided and then stopped abiding because that would put him under the category of did not abide. So again, two types of people, those that abide and those that don't abide. There's really only two types of people, case closed. So there you have it, folks. Yes, they were a branch in Christ, but no, they were not saved. They were just going through the temporary process of trying to be grafted in, but the graft would not be successful. Okay, so again, if you actually just look at the analogies that Jesus uses and just try and understand them, again, conditional security still falls apart. Okay, now obviously in, in John 15, it looks more like it's sort of about works and obedience rather than faith specifically, but here's what I'm arguing, is that there's not enough clear text to say that there's even talking about salvation anyway. But let, let's just pick up, if it were talking about uh, salvation, well, let, let's let's take verse 7, for instance. It says, if you abide in me, my words abide in you. So there, there's a mutual relationship there, okay? They're not, they're not excluded from each other. Okay, so if somebody did not successfully graft, they, they don't abide in him, the, the question then is, why? Why didn't they abide? Well, Jesus already used this word abide back in John 5.38. He said and to a group of people who didn't believe him, you have not his word abiding in you, for whom he has sent, you believe not. So there it is, folks. If somebody doesn't abide as far as salvation is concerned, it's because they believe not. Okay. And if you want to make it about works, well, he's not even mentioning sins and all these terrible, evil things in this passage anyway. He's just not mentioning that as the topic. Okay. So in conclusion, then, the, the key point that Jesus is getting across here is confidence, comfort, and encouragement. That's what he's doing with his disciples. He's giving them that, he's trying to get them that confidence in what he's about to do. He's trying to give them comfort. Now, you might say, well, okay, we, we have the comforter, we have the Holy Spirit. But if I'm trying to say that confidence is a key word there, why doesn't this word appear here? Well, I grant you, it doesn't appear in, in this passage, okay? But we, what we can do is, we can tie the word confidence with the word abide, okay? Specifically in, in relation to eternal life as well. So let, let me cross-reference this with another passage that talks about abiding, and it's written by the same guy who wrote John's Gospel, presumably, okay? So 1 John chapter 2 uh, he, he, he uses the word abide and confidence quite across this uh, epistle, actually. I'd say, actually, regarding eternal life, it's probably the most difficult book in the New Testament to understand, really, I guess. But um, if we if we go down in chapter 2, he talks about um, here. So we've got, um, who is the lie, but he that denies the Christ, whosoever denies the Son, the same as not the Father. So obviously, in the opposite to that, let that therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. So it's not about your work so much as it's about what you've heard, the message that you've heard. If that remains in you, that message, you shall also, as a result of that, continue in the Son and in the Father. So if, if that, what was heard in you remains in you. So again, you accepted the gospel. You accepted uh, the message of salvation. You accepted that and you've held on to that. Well, then. As a result of that, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. These things I have I written concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of many, uh, sorry, received of him abide in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things against that Holy Spirit there, anointing, if you like. And this is truth and is no lie. And even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. So again, the Holy Spirit teaching you, you shall abide in him. Very similar to what he was saying, uh, what Jesus was saying in John 14 and 15. And now, little children, abide in him. Why? Why should we abide in him? That when he, he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. So there you go, tying in confidence with abiding and eternal life. So there's the goal, okay? Don't give up with your faith. Keep on going at it. Get grafted in, okay? And if that, what you've heard, stays in you and it stays with you and you keep that, you have the promise of eternal life and you shall continue in the sun. Whereas those that aren't grafted successfully and don't keep that well, they don't have that promise. They didn't continue the sun. Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not, okay? So it doesn't violate one saved, always saved at all, okay?